Good morning, here we are. Happy long weekend for those of you who have a long weekend. And those of you on the other side of the world have no idea what the long weekend is. Today is a holiday for some of us over here in Canada. Victoria Day, and it's a day off for many. And so here we are, ready to teach again, looking at the whole area of the conduct of the church and leadership. And we've got a kind of a little bit bigger title today, but in this whole area of doctrine of church care. And uh, there is a lot of scriptures to look at today. And so we need to get going at it very quickly. But this section is going to be where Paul teaches Timothy about church care, how to care for individual people in the church and how to get the church to care for people. This is a unique thing is because so often, <laughs> you know, we are very um, individually orientated people. And so we need to uh, be taught how to care in a greater way, not only for our own spiritual care uh, with the Lord, but also we're responsible to care for, as it were, our neighbor or fellow believers that are in the church. And so... Paul is going to teach Timothy how to care, how to encourage the church to care one for another. Uh, but the biggest challenge that uh, we're looking at today in these 16 verses is how to care for widows. And so some of you who watch every day I know are widows. And I used to be a widow, widower for a time being. So I will know I know what that's all about a little bit anyway, not in a great great detail, but uh, there it was an issue uh, in the Ephesian church concerning widows, and uh, there was an if issue in the church, the body of believers as a whole, concerning widows, and if you remember. Over in Acts, uh, when they uh, gain propose the need for deacons, uh, it was on the basis that they had to have somebody who would look after the widows. And in many instances, the widows here, of course, in this section are talked about as women. And so there are widowers and then there is widows. And uh, back in the time when Paul was writing to the Ephesian church, uh, men tend not to live as long, uh, maybe because of hard work or, you know, the toils in the field. I'm not sure uh, why that uh, even to this day, often uh, women outlive men. And, uh, you know, maybe, you know, that was the same issue back then. So there was a lot of widows and there was a problem within the church what to do with widows. And so they proposed that they would get deacons who would look after this kind, part of their ministry would be to minister to widows or to show care and responsibility. And so this was kind of the background to what is taking place uh, that Paul is now going to, in First Timothy chapter 5, begin to exhort the people what to do with older men, what to do with older women, what to do a large section, what to do with widows. And then he's going to talk to us about the whole area, elders and masters and others. And so there's a section concerning how do we care for one another? And I know that as being a pastor, there was always that issue. How do we care for one another. And a lot of times, caring is not just words. Caring is actually doing something physically, uh, not only meeting the physical needs, but the emotional needs and the spiritual needs of these various people groups that are found within the church. And so when Paul is speaking to Timothy, he, you know, he's dealing with the real issue. What do we do with these various kinds of people in the church? Now, we see here in, in 1 Timothy chapter 5 where it says the older man and the older woman. But we could easily translate this. I mean, it's not necessarily um, the way we should, but we could easily translate this as our seniors. 
What do we do with our seniors, with our older people that are now retired? And uh, sometimes we don't know what even to do with them. <laughs> you know, and they don't know what to do with themselves. And so Paul is going to start off by saying in, in verse 1 of chapter 5, Do not rebuke the older man, but exhort him as a father. And so he, you know, Paul is saying, okay, we got these older men. Maybe they're not able to do as much or they're not able to travel as much or work as much. Don't rebuke them. Give them some room and exhort them and encourage them, you know, uh, how they have walked and then their journey, what they have done and what they continue to do. And now uh, exhort them to continue to be involved in the church continue to be doing something in the church and so here it doesn't use the idea of seniors but you know when it's talking about older men it's talking about probably people that are you know retired and we don't know what retirement age is because they didn't have retirement programs and they didn't have whittlers allowance and all these other things that at uh, one time the church sort of provided and now the government provides and so can you imagine what it would be like to be an older person, but have no pension? You know, that would be a real challenge for a lot of people around the world. And of course, the interesting is a lot of people don't get pension around the world. That's kind of a North American and European type thing that we've been able to have pension. But in a lot of other cultures around the world, there is no such thing as a pension. There's no such thing as a widow allowance. And that responsibility then fell upon the church to know how to care for these people. So we think, well, you know, things have changed because we look at things from a North American perspective. I remember uh, Colwyn's mom, uh, she was retired and she had been a teaching principal of a university. So she's the principal teaching other uh, teachers how to teach okay and uh, when she retired uh, her uh, pension I believe we, we figured out worked out to about 60 cents a month mm -hmm. Canadian, <laughs> Canadian. Yeah, slowly now it's gone up since then <laughs> but it wasn't even worth to go down and then she had to go to the office to get it to claim that she was still alive and that not only to claim she was still alive, but she could have that 60 cents a month, Canadian. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I mean, the taxi costs more to go get the, the 60 cents a month than it was just, but you had you wanted to, I guess, out of pride or whatever. This is what the government gave you, you know, 60 cents. And so you went and got it. So we we don't understand as a church a lot of this stuff that we take for granted. I'm now I get a pension every month. I probably couldn't live on it, but I have a pension every month now because I'm over sixty five, and some take early pensions and all these kinds of things. And so, and then there's widow's allowance that if if you know your husband or your spouse has died that you could receive and and. Uh, I got a little bit of that when Irene passed away. wasn't much because, well, she didn't uh, pay into a lot. And so there wasn't a lot that came out of it. And then after I got my pension, they took that away. So, you know, <laughs> so, you know we've relied a lot here on the North American side or the European side on pensions and everything. But um, a lot of parts of the world, like Africa and Asia and that, there is no such thing. And uh, maybe that's why they want to come to our country. Maybe that's why they want to live here for a while, because they know they can be taken care of, hopefully, when they get older. Not always well, but that's what it's all about. And so when Paul begins to say, do not rebuke the older man, you know, don't say, well, come on now, get doing this and that and all these other kind of things. No, he might be not able to do the things that he used to do. So exhort him, build him up. And so exhort him as a father and younger men as brothers. So younger men, the men who were still capable of working in that, continue to exhort them 
and to begin to look at older, older men as fathers and younger men as brothers. So are you, are you following me so far? So it's talking about relationship and it's talking about caring because you will, if, you know, when you think of an older man and if you just think of him an old, as an old man, you may not care for him very much. But if you think of him with a different attitude that, hey, that older man, now some of you need to think that way about me, he would think about, oh, that old man, well, he's a father. And in many cultures around the world, that's what they're also called, fathers. They just don't call them old old man, seniors. They call them fathers. Isn't that interesting? Or some cultures, even North America, call um, them elders or wisdom keepers or whatever you want to culture you want to deal with. You know, there is a level that, you know, Paul was trying to say to Timothy, okay, you got these old people now respect them and exhort them as fathers. And for the younger men, respect them as your brother. Because you, hopefully you're going to teach it. Uh, I would just sort of say, uh, think of a brother differently than you would just think of a man walking on the street. You know, if I was to look at some of the people, you know, walking down the street. Yesterday, someone walked by who is older than mine. And I was saying, I was thinking about that. Well, I'm exhorted to think of that older man walking by as my brother or as my father. I have a 96-year-old lady living next door. My Bible says I should exhort her and think of her as my mother. And we do. <laughs> you know, and so it's interesting how... The way you put titles on things determines how you're going to uh, relate to them or speak to them or minister to them. Okay, so do not rebuke the older man, but exhort him as a father and a young man as a brother. Then he goes and does the same thing with the older woman. Older women as mothers and younger women as sisters. And so he's saying to okay you know this is the way now when you see that older woman that one who is senior or retired or whatever you know treat that as a mother and because hopefully when you're treating these people as fathers and mothers you have a different attitude and a different respect and a different place of caring and so we need to see and change our eye focus about those around us. See, a lot of times we have in our history over the last of the while, and I saw a big report on this the other day on the news, that we have not respected our seniors at all in many ways. And uh, we've left it up to the government to do everything. And unfortunately, the government is going to do whatever they can do, um, very basic and everything like that. Well, the church was not supposed to be that way. They were saying, hey, you know, look after these people, care for these people. And so we as North Americans have a little, well, a lot to learn in this area of how we should deal with people, how we should show respect, how we should honor, how we exhort. You know, when you're in the mall and you see someone, in, in, you know, walking around with a cane or is older, how do you treat them? You know, how do you respond to them? How do you respond to the older ladies that are in your midst? And so Paul was saying, you know, this is what you got to do. This is how you got to respond. And Timothy tell the church that with the older believers in their church, the seniors tell the Ephesian church that they need to think of them as their fathers. And tell the Ephesian church with the older women to think of them not as, well, they're just old, but to think of them as their mothers. Fathers and mothers who have conceived and gave birth. And it's interesting, he's going to pick that up a little bit as we get move on. And it's interesting here that he adds a little clarification on verse 2. Older women as mothers and younger women as sisters with all purity. 
So that means when you're looking at these younger women and you're as men, you're looking at them with decency, integrity, integrity, and innocence. You know, your men, be careful how you look at younger women. Don't look at them in this particular way in a, in a perverted or sexual way. Look at them that they're your sister. So it's interesting what he says here right after, off the bat when he begins to talk about caring. He, he takes this first group of people and says, okay, you've got the older ones and you've got the younger ones. Older ones, treat them as your father. Younger ones, treat them as your brother and sister and do it with purity. But then he goes on and he starts off by talking to us in verses 3 through 16. He gets into this whole issue of widows. And again, it, it took me a lot of time to sort this all out because I pretty well can say I, I don't remember anybody preaching on this section about widows. Uh, I guess we've turned that over to the government of whatever the government are, even though that some of you who are watching at this moment may have no idea what we're talking about. And uh, I just thinking too, that like I've been told that there's a number of children that watch with their mom and dad, this, this telecast and children, you may not understand a little bit what we're talking about. We're glad that you're joining us, but we, you know, again, Children, there's a place that, that you got to honor your mother and father, but there's a place that you need to honor your grandparents. And then when you go to church, you need to have greater respect for those who are older. Okay, so Paul is trying to teach because he knows the church is made up of a variety of different people, younger and older and widows and other kinds of people. And he's trying to speak to that. Because, and kids, this is what I want to say to you, because the role of being a Christian is that you're willing to serve and care for others. It's, it's really important that we really care. Now, in our society, we're so busy being busy that we don't have time. But sometimes, it, you know, if you're a younger young person and you can be entrusted with a lawnmower or a rake or whatever, Go over and start showing some caring to those around you, to other fellow believers. Moms and dads, we need to train our children to care for widows and older and younger people within the body of believers. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's what Paul is getting. So that's why, you know, this is not preached about too often. I, in fact, I don't even know, even when I was trying to study this, and very few people even wanted to write on it because they just don't know what to do with it. And and the only reason why this section, and I thank God that God <laughs> raised up Cohen and, and made it possible that me and her could be a husband and wife and then I could live for many, many years over in Myanmar. Because all scriptures come from an Asian point of view, you know, whether we like it, I mean, they're from God's point of view, working by the Holy Spirit through people's lives. But it's important that we understand what how we are interconnecting with one another. So then when he goes on in verse 3, and he begins this large exhortation, and I would say it's large for a small letter when you are willing to give 13 verses to a subject, that's large. And he says, start off right at the very beginning of verse 3, honor widows who are really widows. <laughs> and I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking, oh, Lord. And I, I, I spent probably hours trying to work my way through these scriptures, trying to think, well, honor widows who are really widows. What in the world is Paul, Paul talking about? Well, the honor idea is respect and to show privilege and to lift up. But there are some widows that they're not really widows. Now, okay, before we get going on this, here's another thing we got to understand. Remember I said that the deacons were put in charge partially to look after widows. And what Paul is trying to say 
that deacons, not all widows need to be looked after by the church. Ooh, what's that? Because they had finances, they had all their needs. Actually, they were very wealthy, some widows. And so what Paul is trying to get at, and we'll see it later on, there was a registry. There was a role where they would go through and as elders and deacons, and say, okay, this widow, we really need to help. This one is being provided with by their own children, being provided by other people, by relatives, being provided for. And so we don't need to help them. Oh, yes, we need to continue to pray. And we need to continue to exhort and encourage. But not all widows needed the financial help or get put on the registry of the church of people who needed to be financially supported by the church. That's key. That's why Paul is saying not all widows are widows. Because you might be thinking, what in the world is he talking? Either they're a widow or they're not, even though if their husband died or did he not die? Well, there's even some issues in there because sometimes widows were called widows because they were also divorced and older. And, you know, some of these words, there gets to be a little bit of confusion sometimes along, but usually a widow or a widower, their partner has passed away. But Paul was trying to say, now concerning the conduct of the church and the conduct of the leaders, we need to review and we need to see, is that widow really a true widow? Because, you know, in our day and age, even though people don't need the money, don't shouldn't get the money, they keep screaming and yelling until they have the money. You know, I mean, a lot of things are done around our world is based on money. And unfortunately, it was probably no different in the church. You know, one widow would see well, another widow, you know, who is getting financial help from the church and then start doing this and saying, well, how come they're getting help? How come they're being looked after? And why am I? Well, you know, you've got five houses and you've got, a, you know, a hundred acres of field. You've got ten servants and you've got a huge family. You know, why can't the church support you? Well, because God is supporting you through other ways. And this is the key. And this is what he goes on that Paul talks about. Because he gets the widows to say, okay, are you really a true widow? And that there is, there's some things. So he talks about this real widow in verses 3 to 7. Honor the real widow. But if any widow has children, so now he's going to give the list here. If anyone will have children, let them first learn some piety at home and to repay their parents. For this is a good and acceptable before God. So if, if widows have children, children the idea of piety is that you show devotion and faithfulness and reverence to your parents that's another thing i learned in asia now not all asians do it but you know if you look after your parents it comes with a blessing you want the blessing of god look after those who looked after you for the first 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. Some don't leave home for a long time. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he's saying here, okay, if you're a widow, honor the real widow, but also at the other widows, if you have children and grandchildren out of piety, help them to learn that they need to be looking after you and be devoted and faithful and show reverence to you as their parents. Well, there's a thought and a half, isn't it? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, but that's what he's talking about, you know. And to and he goes on and he looks what he says here. Show piety at home and to repay their parents. For this is good. Repay. Help out. They helped you out. They got you established. And to remember when they die, you get everything anyway. So help them out. And this is good. And he says it's good and acceptable before God. So that's why in other scriptures, Paul and Peter and others talk about there's a blessing of looking after the older 
and the older men and the older women. But there's a blessing that when you look after widows, and, and why it's saying real widows, that's the ones who are the church needs to look after if they have no other support in that. And the regular widows, widows, if you want to call it regular widows, who have, you know, uh, children and grandchildren and they have, you know, they're, the scripture is saying, hey, come on now, look after your mom and dad. I thank God that, uh, you know, a lot of people now are building grandma and grandpa suites. You know, there is a turn away from putting them in old people's homes and saying, no, we got to figure out how to, you know, they looked after. I love that. Praise God for that. There is a, a heart of the children are turning back to their fathers and mothers. And not just saying, okay, now we'll put them in a home and maybe that's what you have to do. I understand all that and, and, that, and don't write me nasty notes. But it's interesting that there's been a shift going on because of COVID and that about how to look after the older men and the older women and the widows. And I know I, you know, going to probably hear about it a little bit, but that's what Paul was trying to work at with Timothy. And he says, when you look after, and when children and grandchildren look after the widows or the older ones, this is acceptable before God. And the idea acceptable is that God is well pleased. He's going to bless you for doing that. And I know a lot of testimonies where people have taken time to look after their moms and dads and, and their grandparents and all that. And when they look back, they thank God they did it. They thank God they did it because there's a blessing, a great blessing. And you don't do it just for blessing, but you're doing it because it's part of what the body of Christ is all about. Amen. Well, let's keep going. We only got two minutes, but we still got another half an hour. So hang in there. It's a holiday. So hopefully you have some time. And so you do what good is in, in the, and good because I want to finish this all together today. So we're going to be a while. And uh, but it goes on. Verse five. Now, she who is really a widow, okay, she who is really a widow and left alone. So that means there's no grandchildren or children or whatever. She's really a widow. She's left alone, got nobody. This is what God's going to say to her. Trust in God. First of all, if you're really a widow, trust in God. Because God will look after you. God will perform miracles. God will take care of you. Trust in God. Isn't that wonderful? And continue in supplication and prayer night and day. Hey, talk to God all you can. If you're a true widow, trust in God and talk to him night and day. Bring your prayers. Bring your needs. Supplication is getting into the deeper request of the Lord. And bring it before the Lord night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. Now, what? How does this all figure in? Well, if she's not a true little, uh, widow and she's trying to get from the church and she's living with all her pleasures, she is dead already because she's dead while she lives. What does that mean? It's trying to say that you know, if you're trying to take advantage of the church or you have all what you need and you're trying to complain and get other people to take care of you, in reality, you're dead to the things of God, even though you're living. So what Paul was trying to do is to get the widows first. If you're truly a widow, seek God, trust God. Don't don't get your eyes on all kinds of pleasures and things. And this is what I deserve. And this is... And I know that's easy to do. You know, I <clears throat> don't want to say this too loud because my wife's listening. But sometimes, uh, you know, I like to complain a little bit. Any of you got the gift of complaining? No, 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 no thumbs up. What's that call it? I raised my hand. So now it's on tape forever for all eternity. But, you know, we got to sometimes trust. We got to pray. We got to seek God. And we got to see, realize that life is not all pleasure. And that we that if we're living for pleasure, then we're probably already dead. But if we're living for Christ, we have the peace, the joy, the blessings of God. Well, then he goes on. And Paul says, and these things command 
that they may be blameless. So Timothy, teach them and instruct them so that they don't fall into any traps as widows or seniors, so that they will be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Unbelievable. An unbeliever. You know, this, I, wow, these people, I don't think are going to want to replay this tape. Because I, but God, God is saying through Paul, through Timothy, hey, if you and your household are not willing to look after your seniors and your widows, then you have denied the faith. Because true faith in God, true faith as a disciple of God, would look after the olders and would look after the widows. And we will see also that we'll look after the sick and the hurting. That's what the body of Christ is all about. It takes care of its people, is what Paul was saying. It cares. It cares for its people. And we used to do that until we gave it all over to the government, and then we asked the government to do it. And of course, now the church has got away from it in North America, not in the rest of the world. Not in the rest of the world. As I say, Colwyn's mom's a widow, and she gets visited often by deacons. And now that she can't get into the church, they come and bring her communion. They come and check on her on a regular basis. You know, praise God for that. That's, you know, <laughs> that's what the church is all about. And if we do not, as a household, not only as a, as a true household, but as a spiritual household, if we do not look after these people we have denied the faith and we're worse than unbelievers. And why does he say worse than unbelievers? It's because even the unbelievers look after their older ones and look after their widows. And if the unbelievers are willing to do that, we should be another whole level above them. Isn't that interesting? Well, we got a bunch of verses. As I say, I'm not going to stop. I'm just going to keep going. I want this all together. So hang in there. If not, come back and watch it later. Verse 9. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the numbers. Okay. Again, this is, you know, so now it's talking about 60 years old. And it's interesting. The lifespan didn't was not really good over in the Asian Rim, you know, uh, during these times of, of health issues and things that... But if a widow was under 60 years of old, don't take them or they should not be taken into the numbers or to put on the roll or to put be put on the registry of the church that they will be looked after. That's what it's talking about here. As I said, I had to spend a lot of time praying and seeking God and say, what is all going on here? And my Asian background really helped me out <laughs> you know, to understand you know, do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, not unless she has been a wife of one man. Now, so here is the exception to the rule. Don't take somebody in under 60. Okay, don't put them on the roll, except under these conditions. And now he's going to give us the conditions that he is talking about. And there's a whole list of conditions. Because it's interesting what is going to take place here. Someone who is under 60 and is a widow and there is conditions that they could be on the roll. And as they were on the roll and being supported by the church, it was also quite evident that the church expected, okay, if we're looking after you and providing for you, you should be serving together with us. You should also be a minister and and be serving in the body of Christ. Wow. There, there is another whole new thought, isn't there? <laughs> I know many of you are probably wondering, wow, it's getting really difficult to be a Christian. No, no, no. It's just we need to get an understanding of what it means to walk as a disciple and be part of a body ministry. So if you're if you are over 60, he goes on and he begins to tell you what did what will take place that you're first of all uh if you've only been a wife of one husband that kind of 
And you say, well, you know, what's happening there? Well, that could be referring back to if you happen to be a deacon and an elder's wife. Remember, because one of the one of the rules was that for a deacon and elder, they were to be a husband of one wife. Now, here is the flip side where Paul is saying, OK, here is the exception to the 60 rule. And one of them is that they're a husband of one or a wife of one man. Hmm. Not only that, he goes on and he gives this in verse 10. Well reported of for good works. They're they're involved in serving. Their their lives are lives of service. They're giving out good works. If she has brought up children, if she has taken care of her children and, and hasn't got rid of them to the orphanage or all these other kings that, you know, sometimes people do with children. And if she is, uh, as has lodged stranger, if she's taken people in who have had no place to, to go in that, and she's taken them in for time being and, and has helped feed them and looked after. So you're going to see that these are all ministries of the church. You know, it's interesting that the church was responsible to help widows, but also the, the church was to have a good report when it comes to children and when it comes to strangers. And so Paul is saying, remember, Paul is telling Timothy, but Timothy is going to tell the Ephesian church. And if she has washed saints' feet, that means that shows that she has had humility. You know, she wasn't up with pride and everything else, but whoever body of believers came over, it was quite customary before they come into your home, you would wash their feet because their feet would be dirty from the journey of the day, full of dust. But it was also very humiliating, you know, to wash people's feet. And in certain cultures and certain religions in the Far East, they still do this. I would, went to a place one time, and, uh, and before I could go into this place, you know, uh, you needed to wash your feet <laughs> and they would help you <laughs> and they would wash them. I'm not going to tell you why, but it wasn't a church. Okay. And, uh, and they, you know, if you brought up children and they lodged strangers and you washed the saints feet and if have believed, or if she has, has uh, received the afflicted, that means if that person, that widow has helped the sick, helped the hurting, maybe helped the lame, all the ones who are afflicted has been involved. Again, doing ministry. If she has been diligent to follow every good work. So she's following. She's, to put it, I put it here in, in, in Call Winds. Again, sorry for always saying Call Winds country, but I learned a lot over there. Uh, Call Wind is actually not only here, is she a, a, a licensed and ordained pastor, but in her country, she is a licensed minister and and i'm wondering if that's where this is coming from because they would minister and do a variety of things i don't know not completely because things change over the time but and they're they're following in good works and then it goes on in verse 11 but refuse the younger widows for when they have begun to grow a want so so now so we got the widows you know, honor them. Then we got the widows under 60, but if they're doing ministry, that's okay. Keep keep providing for them. Keep them on the roll. Keep them on the list. But then he goes on and from verses 11 to 15 talks about the younger widows. And there's a problem with the younger widows because there's a lot of dangers that they face as younger widows. And Paul wanted to make Timothy aware of this and make the church aware of it. So what happens with the younger widows, but refuse the younger widows for when they have begun. So refuse to put the younger widows on the list, is what he's saying. Because what's going to happen sometimes with them, they're going to become growing wantum against Christ. Which means, what do you mean wantum? That they want a husband more than they want Christ. What? That's the whole idea here. Because they're 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 younger and and there's nothing wrong with that, but they started off by wanting you know Christ to be their first love, and so what happens? They then turn away from their first love, and now are seeking after the things of the world and other men. And that's why he's begun to grow wanton against Christ. 
they desire to marry. And so in the other idea, what was showing up later that Paul talks about in other places, that oftentimes when a widow became a widow, they would then commit themselves to serving 100% Christ and would not seek after going back into a worldly relationship. It's interesting. Having condemnation because they cast off their first faith or they cast off their first love. They cast off what they had committed to do. So Paul didn't want to put them on a list because if because if you put them on a list, that meant now that the church was going to look after them and that meant that they would become continue to be ministers of God where Paul was saying, be careful with the younger ones because, you know, that they may want to turn back and just be married. Not trying to read more into here. And besides, they have learned to be idle. So what happens, younger women who become widows, and if the church begins to look afterwards, you know, even though they have the strength to feed themselves and to work and to get a job and all that kind of, they become idols and they begin to wander about from house to house. Because now they don't have to worry about their needs. And so they just got now free time. Paul said, no, if they're younger, you know, then they need to begin to look after themselves and take care of themselves. Ooh, that sounds harsh. But what Paul was trying to be careful of, that if they came onto the church rolls or the church registry, they could then feel, oh, I don't got nothing to do. I can do whatever I want. You know, I got my needs paid for and so forth and so on. And what happens, Paul says, they become idle and they begin to become gossipers and busybodies. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about, woo, Paul. You know, when this letter gets read to the Ephesian church, there's going to be an uproar over there. That's all I can say. And busybodies saying things which they ought not to say. Because they get involved in gossip, and then they begin to spread that gossip around, and because they don't have to get out and work. And, it, and, and it's interesting. You want some understanding about widows? You know where to go find it? Yes, in other parts of the scripture, Paul talks about it, and Jesus talks about it. But, you know, another place you might want to have a good look at it, the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth. They were true widows. or, And what did they do? They were starving in the land that they were in. And she thought, Naomi thought, maybe we go back to our own homeland. Maybe some of our relatives will look after us. And she said, Naomi, to her two daughters, Hey, why don't you stay here? There's a better chance that some of your relatives will look after you. And there's a better chance that now that you've been married, that you could get married again. And one daughter says, sure, I'm going to stay back. But Ruth says, no, I'll go where you go. Your God will be my God. And whatever the price is, I'm willing to die for it. So they wander back as two helpless, poor women. And what did they do? They didn't sit around in their house. They were able to probably get an old abandoned house, maybe their old house that they were that they left from in the first place during famine, and they were going back. And what did Ruth do? See, Naomi was the older and probably wasn't able to do a lot of the farming. So what did Ruth do? She went out and knew and was told by Naomi, go to the fields that while they're reaping, because the Old Testament scripture says that those who harvest a field must leave a little bit of grain left in the field for the poor and the widows. That was the right that they had. That's the only thing that they had. And so Ruth would go out and she was picking up the grain that was left over in the fields so that they could then take that grain and take it home with a little bit of oil, make some cakes out of it, and at least exist. But one of the other rules that Scripture says 
that if you go back amongst the relatives, there is a possibility that there's a kinsman redeemer. Trust in God. Trust in God. And while Ruth was redeeming, while Ruth was gathering up the grain to fill the, the, the stomach of the older mother, something that the relatives would be doing, she's an outsider now becoming part, and she's beginning to obey the family rules. She came back to look after her mother-in-law, which is an amazing thought. And so he's saying, don't be out there sitting around and gossipers and being a busybody and that. Go do what you can do to feed yourself and to feed those around you. The story of the Ruth is a good example of that. And then, of course, she meets Boaz, who becomes her kinsman redeemer. And not only she becomes the kinsman redeemer, Boaz, and redeems her from making her part of moving her from being a former for, foreigner to a family. But the most powerful thing that we can get from Ruth that she becomes part of the genealogy of our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's her God. Verse 14, therefore I desire, therefore I desire that younger widows marry, maybe bear children, you know, manage the house, give opportunity, and so, or the, so that they don't give opportunity to the adversity to speak reproach. So he's saying to you, these younger women, come on now. You know, if you get back, get working, and if and if it works out, get married, have children. That's okay, because that's more important that you do that than become idols and gossipers. Because if you become the idols and gossipers, you become a reproach to God and a reproach to the body of Christ. So if you're younger, go out and fulfill your your will. Take time to pray. Take time to have in prayer and supplication. Take time to trust in God that he would bring someone else into your life. And I experienced that. God gave to me a call in. So that we that we would not be a re I would not be a reproach or that here it's talking about women. Verse 15, for some have already turned af aside to, after Satan. And so he's saying to her, he said, watch out because some have turned aside. Because they've got into this trap of having all this freedom and being young and still having energy and zeal and still wanting to be married and all these kinds of things. And now they're being looked after by the church and they're becoming gossipers and busybodies and all those kinds of things. And Paul was saying, watch out because the, the end of that road is that they will become a reproach and they will end up doing the will of Satan and not the will of Jesus Christ. And they'll have turned aside to say, wow, these are powerful things that nobody ever talks about. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I just say, I don't know when the last time I heard this preached on, anyone preach on. But then he switches around and we're getting close to the end now because 16 is a, uh, thank you for your time. I know we're probably taking an hour this morning, but we, we've got to, I want to get this all together because it's it's important that, that we see that, there is a responsibility when it comes to this conduct and care for the older and the younger, for the seniors, uh, citizens, for the real widows, for the people of the household, for the younger widows. And then he's going to go on and just kind of tie it all together in verse 16. And he says, if any believing man or woman has widows, 
So if there is some widows in your relationships, let them relieve them or let them take care of them. Let them provide for them. Is there somebody in your circles that are widows? Then look after them. And let them relieve them. And do not let the church be burdened. So what, he, what Paul was trying to say. There was so many widows lining up. That the church could not financially afford. To look after all of them. And so Paul was saying. We need to have a standard here. Of how we're going to care. And who we can care for. And that you know. I know we have communion, and at communion we take up alms, and then we give that to the poor. But in reality, in the early church, they took up offerings in that to care for one another. To care for the sick, to care for the hurting, to care for the widows. That's what they did. And Paul was saying, some of these people that are being cared for shouldn't be on the list. Other family members, other household, other relatives have the ability to take care of them. And they should be cared for by them first. And at the end of that, if they're really a true widow and no one's caring for them, and they meet these criteria that Paul was talking about, then the church should care for them. To care for all their needs. Not just to give them a love gift once in a while. Uh, again, I'm going to get in trouble today in big time. <laughs> Whatever. But to care for them. To care for them. Because this is what honors God. This is what the body is all about. That we care one for another. And he goes on, that the church may not be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. That it may be able, the church may be able to focus on those who are really widows. Wow. Long session this morning, but I think it all needs to come together as one piece. And I thank you for taking the time to understand that as we've titled this, the doctrine of care, that we look at the scriptures have a place of how the church should care for its seniors, how the church should care for real widows, how the church, the household of the church, that the, the church is made up of households and that they have a responsibility to care, and how the widows under 60, how they need to meet our criteria. And if they are meeting this criteria that the church should care for them. And for the younger widows, that if you have the ability to work like Ruth did, to care for yourself and others, do it. Be willing to get married and have children. And then the church itself needs to understand that it does have a responsibility to care, to care for the needs of their widows. Now, I know in North America, we got widows pensions and we got old age pensions and all those things. And we've allowed the government to take over something that maybe the church was to give the example of. But those of you who are watching, in the Asian Rim and Africa and all those other places. It's not going to be easy. But scripture is given to us because it's life. It's free. It's an example. It instructs. It commands us. And if we really truly want to be part of the full body of Christ. We need to heed to what the word has to say to us. And if we're pastors and leaders, we maybe need to take some time to step back and saying, how are we really, really caring for the people? 
It doesn't talk about un unbelievers. These, these widows are believers. These seniors are believers. These young men and young women are believers. The context is believers. And the context is that the church is there to care for all members of the body of Christ. And Paul is giving instruction to Timothy to tell the Ephesian church that. And so you of my friends and fellow pastors and leaders around the world, I know it's difficult. And I know when, when Colin and I go back to Myanmar, often we visit the senior pastors, the senior leaders, the people who have been retired. I don't know why Colin and I have such a burden for the elderly and for the widows and the sick. And we visit a lot of them in Myanmar, to pray for them, to minister to them, to give them love gifts that will hopefully take them to another step. But pastors, leaders, people who are teachers in churches around the world, Paul is exhorting us to care one for another in all areas. Can we pray? Father, this is the day that you have made. This is the word that you have spoken. This is the truth that you have given. And Lord, I know I wrestled with this scripture for many hours. But thank you, Lord, for showing me. Thank you for fulfilling your commitment that all scriptures is life-giving. Life breathed by your Holy Spirit. And Father, that we shouldn't just run over them and move on to the more important things. This was so important that Paul wrote Timothy and encouraged Timothy to speak it to the church. And I pray today that, that I thank you that today was a holiday and that some could give some extra time because I think this is so important for the church around the world today. So Lord, I pray that we will be hearers of your word and not only hearers, but doers also. And I thank you that your Holy Spirit continues to speak, guide, and give us truth that will help us all to be set free. And Lord, I pray today that we will show care one for another, whoever it may be, wherever we may be this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, I feel like I need to go for a walk and just do some crying. And ask God for some forgiveness too. Scriptures are so powerful. They're so freeing. They're so liberating. And we just need to follow them. Amen. We love you. Keep on keeping on. And Lord willing. It's going to talk tomorrow about how we need to care for our elders. Those in leadership. We love you all. We know many of you are also seniors that watch each morning. We know most of you are also pastors around the world, and we love you. We're praying for you, praying for those in Ukraine, praying for those in, in wars around the world. And I want to tell you that because of some of you who are seniors that are watching every day, I'm going to be praying for you a whole lot differently today. And if we've fallen short, forgive us. But we're going to trust God. And we're going to pray in supplication, believing in the truth of the word of God. Amen. Love you now. Have a great day in Jesus. Amen. Bye-bye.